Good. Well, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really happy that we're all here. Uh, that was something, a decision which was postponed as long as we could. And fortunately, Ambleside was very cooperative, cooperative in, in allowing us to not make firm commitments. Um, because it has been a very good tradition to, to meet in person and to uh, have talks like these and to continue those over our prints and our big poster sessions. So since this wasn't happening last time, it's much better, I can, um, because of the of the the COVID and the conference all being uh, cancelled, and I had some personal things with because my dad passed away, so I wasn't not attending. So it, it's time to give you an update on what we are doing with this project and where it's going, and it's it's in good condition. I can say that. So if I can have the next. So let's first look who are all there because we have a, a good group of people. So Ed is still there, Ed, so maybe stand up. Well, Ed is not here. Ed is listening in there. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, we have Vicky, of course, who's been uh, doing great work on the project. Uh, we have Elisa, Elisa, who sits over there and just ran out. Now, um, as with the new project, we have two additional members that put in real effort and actually get a little bit compensated for their employers. That's Gary. Uh, Gary's over there. Gary does quite a bit of programming and uh, is also uh, diving into the underpinning model stuff to get that back into order because we have some things there. And we have Brian, who's kindly volunteered to be the secretary of the CCBN project. Because as you know, the project is not me. I'm just the chair of the project. I'm the grant holder. I run the day-to-day -day things. But the project actually is a community project with a charter and a secretary. So that's what he's doing. Now, we also have Luca. Luca was a PhD student last time when I physically were there. He's graduated by now. And he's now still on the project, being employed all from income that we generate. I'll get back to that one. For a brief period, we had Joanna doing some work because she is an EM uh, person doing some EM, and she had been looking and doing some groundwork to see how EM and NMR actually play together because I think that's sort of a challenge where we want to put some things in, in analysis structure to make and facilitate that better. And I'm happy to say that with the funding of the project, I elbowed my university in supplying another PhD student position, so for which I recruited Morgan Hayward, who's here now, uh, maybe stand up, and he's going to be working on the metabolomics aspects of the project. So we have a dedicated person starting and putting more effort into that. And then, of course, there's me still here. Okay, so what did we actually get and uh, manage to do? So we wrote uh, the new MRC partnership grant, which got awarded in October, starting in April of this year. Another five years. Um, I think the next slide shows the numbers. Okay. Briefly. Um, so we have uh, a set of the old suspects, which continued on the new grant. We also have some new people there. You see their distribution on the screen there with the black dots. Um, and their names are listed there. So it includes all the major NMR centers in, the, in Europe, which is good. It includes good partners in the US in the form of the NMR box people, for example. Um, we have a partnership with Japan now, which is good because they're going to do something specifically geared for the Japanese community and uh, you see the other dots. So uh, very happy to have them and that they uh, will support it. Now, um, now. I'm just going to say next slide, and you just can you just say that? Now, that's what senior PIs do, I think, by now. <laughs> so, uh, virtual style, that is. So, 1.6 million we got for five years, so five fully funded. They didn't cut us back, which is really good. Um, we have 2.6 FTEs. That was my strategic decision because the, the word was out that they didn't want to fund everything. And since we had 2.8 uh, employment, it made sense. So five years of conferences is included, so we can continue. This is the first year. And of course, some travel and the usual bits and bobs which go with this grant. Now, of course, we need to specify what we're doing. And here's the Gantt chart of the different tasks which are in the, in the partnership and this grant. 
And if you, you see, there's a number of categories. So the, the top category is just core maintenance, uh, uh, bug fixing, releases, all that kind of stuff. Essentially, this is pretty much what Ava is doing. But then we have like three main topics, which is um, biomolecular assistant uh, NMR for the medical orientation and NMR for uh, with an, an industrial orientation, just to sort out these, these topics. And of course, they sort of combine with the different programs that we're doing, the different kind of things that we're doing. Uh, and also with the different developers, because each one of them have an assigned task. So Vicky is doing, uh, apart from a lot of the outreach, also most of the people interacting on the spectroscopy side with her background in solid state NMR and liquid state NMR. Elise is working on all the structure related aspects. So that's what she's doing in analysis structure. So we have Luca, uh, still on the analysis screen and industrial engagement, which is his main task of doing there, working with the industrial partners. And we have Morgan now working on the metabolomic side of the things. And then, of course, uh, the, there's all the outreach, the conferences, and the thing. that's the yellow part in the bottom there. So if you're really interested, I can show you that. But of course, this is in, in practice, we, we take things in a sensible session and, and Vicky will come back to that on the new developments. Yeah, next slide. So uh, we published a couple of papers. Um, there's, uh, they're on the, on the list there. Uh, Luca and I just completed another one which is about to sub be submitted. And there's some uh, a review which is long overdue, but uh, uh, it's sort of on my desk to finish that off. Next one. Now, um, the real success in the last year has been the really good and steady increase of all our industrial users. So you see it over here that uh, we now have 12 V3 licenses, one V2 licenses, and there's already four people still on trial license. So we give them like three months to try out a program, to work with us, to see that it works. And you see the list of the people down there which have subscribed by now. So that created uh, 26,000 in 2020 and uh, 38,000 already in this year, which is really good. And it essentially pays his salary. That's, that's what it's doing. So we get a free postdoc from all the licenses that we sell. Um, now, where's that is very good news. There's also a, a, an issue of sustainability. And I think that is going to be the topic that is going to be really important in the next five years. And there's two points that I want to make to that. First of all, money is always going to be a, an issue. Whenever I sit in the joint CCP meetings where they're granting agents, and they're always moaning about giving us this money and doing this and blah, blah. Is it really necessary that we spend all this money? And then we seem to be managing to convince them that it is a good project and money wisely spent. Of course, now with getting this industrial income, it's actually sort of, it's a good thing because we can show relevance for industry and we, we, we fund extra ac um, additional activities. At the same time, it is a little bit of a danger thing that they say, well, you don't need this one thing because you already get paid one from the Eastern income in the future. So that's something I'm hoping to try to guard against that I know that is not so because this is academic and this is industrial and Luca is doing things that we should not be doing from money otherwise. They pay us to do things. But there's, a, a, there's, there's something which really, really needs to come across in the next five years. And that's the community involvement. And what do I mean? I mean, you guys are here, that's great. But we need more of you. What we need to show as a community is the relevance of NMR by doing really good science. But we also should, are, it's important that we continue to show and expand on showing the relevance of this project in how it supports that that science that you're doing. Because uh, we need to move away that we do the things and we invent a tool and we invent and write some code. It should be more that you guys also come with the things that you contribute. A, a little macro which does something and which is handy. We have the mechanism in place to share that kind of things. So what I think is, is where actually I'm going to challenge you, or I'm asking you to step up, is to start doing with the, the framework, the platform that we build, the kind of things that you would like to be doing, rather than saying, okay, it's not there, or send us an email, we can help you out, we can get you started, but you can start developing little things yourself, and the little things become bigger and bigger, uh, and then they become even bigger at some point in time. So 
we need you to start writing macros, essentially, doing things, automating things. This whole library of all the tools, which you've shown about, is all available within the program. We have the SciPy uh, kit, we have NumPy, we have all these uh, packages installed free. You can just, you don't have to do anything to, to work with that, and you can use those tricks to apply to your own data. So that starts with realizing that, and maybe you write your first little macros, we, we can help you, we have, we have tutorials on how to do this, but then at some point you say, well, this is maybe a little bit too complicated, let's see if we can do something together. So you come with that idea and we give you some pointers, but it also will require input from you. It's not that we can do all the things that are being asked for, it's just too much. But we can help you get going, we can solve the, the bottlenecks for you, and actually we have some some examples on how that is working with Gary and Brian, which have master students say, okay, we were doing this, can we do this, how does, and then we, if we divert the attention for a, a few days or a week to, to implement something that they need for that project, and then they can, they're on their way there again. So that is, in my view, a good way of doing collaborative things. And the more we have that, if uh, over five years, there's a list of 100 macros contributed, con contributed by the community, then I can tell them, you see, this works. It's not us you're funding, it's you're funding 100 people or, or, or 20 other people, groups, which share that thing again with the community. So that's my vision, that's my hope, and that's my dream. Okay, so again, what can we do? We can provide you the specific expertise to get started. We can, um, oh, sorry, the role of the partners. Well, the partners have a special role in doing this as well. So one of the, the, the main criticism when we wrote the grants is you don't specify very much what your partners are doing. So in the rebuttal, we made some more concrete things. So of course they provide specific expertise but there also are outreach platforms, and actually that's been going quite well because we've been going to their workshops, we've been going to their, uh, their, to their user communities, giving and being present there and, and propagating the project at every occasion. But what we are going to do and envision is that we are going to have more regular engagement in the form of workshops and afternoon meetings because each one of the partners brings in a specific expertise and we get one or two of their postdoc to present something like this via Zoom, so you can all join in and then have a question or maybe a workshop or something related. That's the idea to, to get more of the, the specific expertise, which within those 20 partners, and that's a lot of knowledge there, into back into the community, our community, but of course open to everybody. Okay, I'm now going to transfer to Vicky, who's going to tell you about much more exciting things that we've been doing and completing, actually, on some of the plans. Right. Okay. So, as you can see, we um, have got a new website. Um, it was about time. The old one was uh, a little old-fashioned, shall we say. <laughs> um, and so, we worked with a, a web designer, and um, this is not just um, prettier and mobile friendly and things, but we hope is also much easier for you to navigate and um, find the things that uh, you might want to get from the website. Um, as well as um, that, we, as well as creating the new website, we've actually also moved it. It was with the University of Leicester. Useful for having lots of disk space, not so useful having very old, out-of-date versions of PHP and MySQL, potential security risks. Um, but also we just can't use um, some of the more modern software. So now with a commercial provider, we are also going to be able to update our forum um, to look a little um, sleeker and nicer, but more importantly, to have much better functionality. So um, we'll be able to transfer everything from the old forum onto the new one, all the user accounts, you'll just have to reset your password, um, but you will then have much um, greater control over um, well, I love the fact that I'm going to be able to basically use it like a mailing list because I prefer that. Um, Gary is going to love the fact that he can have um, weekly digests because he likes that. So, you know, you have um, a lot more uh, control over how to use it. And then over time, we will add other um, functionality to it as well. Uh, now, we had hoped to um, put the new website online before the conference. And then last week, 
we kind of chickened out because we realized we're going to have to set up new subdomains and things. And although it looks quite easy on Google, we hadn't actually ever done it before. And we thought perhaps it was safer to wait until after the conference. So within the next couple of weeks, hopefully um, that will be done. The um, other thing that we had hoped to do before the conference was to release our new version of the software. Um, but we just haven't had time to do enough testing over the summer. So rather than um, presenting you with something that will have a whole load of bugs in it, um, we'll give it a few more weeks and um, get it properly tested and, and sorted for you, and then we'll release that. Uh, but what I am going to do now is tell you about some of the things that are new in it and um, some of our priorities for the uh, coming year. Now, when thinking about priorities, of course, um, we've got a huge long to-do list and um, everything is vying to be at the top of our priority list. So I thought it might be helpful um, just to kind of take you through um, some of the different types of things that we have to consider um, for our priorities. So obviously one big aspect is um, moving features from version two to version three. Um, and at this point, I'd like to say thank you very much to the 112 respondents to our survey. It was very helpful to get a sense of uh, which Features in version two are most heavily used and therefore are the most important for us to, to move over um, soonest. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what those are uh, later. Um, but as well as doing that, we also um, obviously need to work on um, improving what is there in version three. There are some things that were implemented quite a long time ago, perhaps weren't implemented in an optimal way. Um, Sometimes when our users start using it, you know, with huge, great projects that we've never, never used um, for testing, then actually things come to light that um, could do with being changed and, and updated. So um, that obviously is also important. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to know. Things that are quick and easy for us to do <laughs> get done quicker than the things that are going to take longer. Um, and then finally, of course, we've got loads of ideas for completely new features that don't exist in uh, version two or version three. Um, those tend to languish fairly low on the priorities, to be fair. But we're really looking forward to, at some point, being able to get our teeth stuck into that kind of stuff. Uh, now, all of these aspects, of course, are things that are very sort of front facing. They're features that you as users will be very um, aware of. Uh, but Alongside that, there is also the sort of behind the scenes stuff. And actually for 3.1, we've done quite a lot of behind the scenes work, which is why we've gone from 3.0 to 3.1 and not to 3.05. Um, it's involved quite a lot of uh, sort of moving code, rewriting some code, um, which, you know, may feel a bit superfluous, but actually it makes the program more robust. Um, it helps us uh, maintain the code much more easily and helps us add uh, things to the code much more easily. So it is actually, I think, in everyone's interest that we do that. Um, we've done a whole bunch of that. There's probably one or two things still around error management and saving that we need to do. Um, but I think otherwise, um, some of the other things can now wait for a few more years before we um, embark on another sort of big uh, kind of behind the scenes effort. And then finally, obviously, it's a program in development, so there are always going to be bug fixes. We try to get those done as quickly as possible, um, but sometimes it can be remarkably difficult to recreate them, particularly things on Windows, always a nightmare. Um, <laughs> and, and if we can't re recreate your bug, then it can be jolly hard to fix sometimes. Okay, so let's have a look at um, what's new and what's next. So I'm going to take you through some of the different aspects of a typical um, NMR project and have a look at what program can do. So obviously processing is something we haven't ever got into and we don't really have any plans to, um, but we can now kind of um, uh, help it along, I suppose. We've already had phasing the program for some time, um, but we've now also added the ability to uh, visualize time domain data so that basically you can use analysis as an alternative to NMR draw, which obviously is going to be particularly helpful for um, people with newer Macs who can't use 32-bit um, programs anymore. Um, then really the bulk of the program is about the sort of spectral visualization and um, assignment process. So what we've done there, one of the big things um, is that we've pretty much rewritten all our data importers um, to make them 
more robust, um, faster, more accurate. Uh, I think uh, Brooker users will be very happy to know that we're finally taking the MC proc parameter into consideration. So uh, you no longer have to make sure that your series has all been processed with the same MC proc parameter, which is going to take that into account automatically. Um, or we can now read um, pseudo 3Ds as we should be able to. And we are also adding um, JCAMP as a format. Um, that means that it should be easy to import data from uh, MNOVA, of interest particularly to some of our industrial users. Um, some other things that we've done, um, the PK aliasing that had been in version three was fairly basic. We've now brought it up to a, a kind of proper level um, as it is in version two. Um, Gary has given us a fabulous new um, Z plane slider bar some reason the one in version three was never as good as the one in version two. Gary has now managed to even better the one than that was in version two. So um, that's all very good. Um, we've got some improvements to the macro editor. Um, a conversation quite a while ago actually with, with Chris resulted in uh, a few changes, including um, these next three. Um, so when you first open the project, you will be presented with some key concepts basically some of the stuff I did at the start of the workshop this morning, just to kind of give you a little bit of a orientation of, you know, what's what in the program, where can you find things, how do you do things. Um, adding tip of the day, because sort of in interactions with users, it's actually remarkable how often people will sort of say, oh, we know, how can I do that? And it's like, oh, well, you know, that's already in there. Um, or pe people hadn't realised stuff was there. So hopefully that will be just a way for people to um, learn some of the little tips tips and tricks um, of how to use the program better. Uh, now, Gerten uh, made me write optimized menus, um, which of course means code for <laughs> slightly changed menus. <laughs> Obviously, none of us like our supermarket aisles to be changed around, and we don't like our program menus to be changed, um, but I do believe that they have truly been optimized and improved, <laughs> um, so that um, you will be you know, they'll be more user friendly, you'll be able to find things more easily, they'll be in more sensible places, um, they will be more in the same sorts of places that they might be in other typical programs that you would use in 2021. So what's coming next? So um, this is a stack of things off uh, the, the, the top 10 in the um, uh, in this from the survey results, things that are in, in version two that um, you know, people want in version three. Um, some of them will be relatively easy to uh, do, such as the, the propagate assignments. Other things will, um, like synthetic peak lists, will take a little longer. Um, I've highlighted a couple of things. The, the reference chemical shifts technically are actually in version three, but um, it's a somewhat basic implementation. And uh, we've actually got some really exciting ideas, um, particularly with our industrial users, as to what we can do there. Um, and then finally, the, the horizontal and vertical separators or tiling. Um, that is something that should be in fairly soon. We've sort of done most of the work for that already. Right, so let's move on. Um, once you've assigned your protein, you might want to do some binding studies. Um, obviously, we've already got um, a nice chemical shift mapping uh, module, uh, which Luca had written. But we are going to make a few tweaks to that, add some things, so um, additional equations um, to cover a variety of different situations. Uh, I think, again, on the, on the survey, um, the different people who wanted the automatic following of peaks um, and also being able to look at shift differences, not just based on peak lists, but also shift lists. Um, and then finally, I think it would be quite good to have a kind of best practice guide. Uh, again, interacting with users is um, you sort of realize it's actually a little bit, you know, there are lots of um, there's some good papers out there, not least Mike's uh, nice paper, um, but it's a bit unclear how you get from the equation in his paper to the equation that's actually in analysis. Um, there's very little about actually how must you have recorded, how, how must your samples have even been, you know, you've got to keep your, your protein concentration constant if this equation is actually going to work. Um, so I thought it'd be good to kind of collect all of that together. Right, dynamics, we've got a whole session on that tomorrow. So it's clearly um, something that's important to people. At the moment, we re don't really do anything for dynamics in version three. Um, but Brian, fortunately, had um, a Columbo master student or summer student um, who was keen to do some programming. 
And so what he's doing is um, creating a way to very easily export data, um, mainly I think peak lists, uh, from uh, analysis via an F file to the program Relax, which obviously has a huge number of um, options for um, analyzing your data, fitting it, um, fitting it to models and all that kind of thing. Um, and then possibly also find ways of importing it back again. Um, longer term, we also obviously want to be able to do the, the sort of fitting of um, intensity changes within analysis in a sort of similar way to how we're doing the, the analysis of uh, chemical shift changes in the chemical shift perturbation module. Uh, and obviously throughout, we'll make sure that we can deal both with series of 2Ds, but also with um, pseudo 3D data. Right, structure calculations is quite a biggie. Um, that's kind of Elisa's domain, as Hayatun already said. Um, officially, analysis structure is kind of a separate, uh, its own separate program. At the moment, the, the structure features are actually still part of um, just the sign, but at some point, um, there will come a point when we'll sort of separate it off. Um, and all of this is going to work basically with, with NEF, the new NMR exchange format. And um, so it's very easy to export a file. You can just select um, whatever bits of data you want and um, export those as an F file. And Explore, Cyana, and Aria are now all reading NEF files. Um, they'll do the calculation and then they will write another NEF file out at the end again. Um, oops, didn't do that. Hang on, whoa, where have we got to? Um, so yeah, you can you can do your structure calculation, um, and then you get another NEF file out again, which you import back into analysis. Um, this is working particularly well with Explore. Um, we've got some macros that kind of help you set up your Explore calculation, and um, so when you then oh, I've got a video. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can just drag your NEF file back into the project. On the left-hand side is um, what your current project. On the right-hand side, the NEF, all the data in the NEF file that you're importing. Um, you can choose which bits you want to import, rename them if you want, and um, then they're in your project. Uh, as I say, it works very well with Explore. Um, we're still working with, uh, with Benjamin to get it optimized for ARIA make sure we get violations out as well as um, peak lists and also with um, Cyana we've still got a little a few hiccups a few things you've got to do manually on the import um, for that next step obviously would be to analyze your violations um, here um, <clears throat> we've got um, a variety of tables for you to do that uh, obviously a few Things are linked so that if you click on your violations, you automatically go to the right peak um, to investigate that. We've now also got a link to PyMole, so you can just click on a button and then have a look at that restraint on your structure in PyMole. Um, we're using PyMole as the sort of initial program to do with this. Ultimately, we'll probably add other molecular viewers as well. And then finally, obviously, you'll want to deposit your data. Again, the nice thing is that um, PDB and the BMRB are now accepting NEF files since last year. So again, all you need to do is export a NEF file. So um, really, uh, you know, we're all used to from version two, the whole kind of format converter thing that is gonna be um, hopefully something of the past. And basically any kind of exchange between programs will go via NEF. And you know a whole range of software developers, as I say, Aria, Cyana, and um, uh, Aria have, have all committed to um, implementing it. But also Amber, um, Yazara, you know there are lots of other um, developers who are making sure that everything is compatible with NEF. So that really is the future. Uh, so then what's coming next, um, we obviously want to, to do a plugin so that you can easily um, run Talos. So Talos is sort of one of the programs that probably isn't of its own accord going to become NEF compatible. So we're going to write a plugin so you can automatically 
send your data, calculate it and get it back into the program. Um, on the RDCs, this time it's their master's student working with Gary um, is working on this. He's uh, developing a macro to uh, calculate your RDCs from your data and then export it again via NEF to Parlers and then import the results back again. Um, all of what we're doing, we're trying to do as much as possible um, with small molecules in mind. So particularly some of our industrial users are interested in um, calculating the structures of um, proteins with small molecules bound. So we're making sure that that works and we're using ChemBuild um, as a nice tool to easily import um, your small molecules into the program. And then finally, another um, thing that shouldn't be too long before it comes along is um, automatic um, generation of uh, WWPDD validation reports. So automatically send off your data uh, to their server and get the, um, the report back. Okay, that leaves us now with um, screening, which is Luca's domain. Now, Luca had done a lot of good work on this um, during his PhD, and then nearly two years ago now, Katrin and I were in Switzerland and we spent a day in Basel with the NMR group at Novartis. And we showed them uh, the, the program and they said, oh, that looks nice. But um, well, the problem is it just still doesn't really address our actual problem. And our real problem is the fact that we can't match our control uh, spectra to our reference spectra. So the issue that's going on is that you've got your library of, let's say, 2,000 compounds and you've got a reference spectrum for each compound. So you've got a lot of different separate spectra. But obviously you're not going to create 2000 samples when you do your screening. So in this case, let's say we're working with 19F data, so we've only got one peak per sample in most cases or per compound. So we'll actually use mixtures of about 20 or 30 uh, compounds um, and screen all of those in one go. Um, in one sample against the protein target. So what you're going to be recording, obviously, is a this control mixture, mixture of these 20 or 30 compounds of your control, then you'll add the protein and then obviously do your analysis to see whether anything binds. Um, now, ideally, you would expect that your control mixture would look like this and basically just be a sum of the individual spectra. But in reality, um, it looks perhaps a bit more like this. I mean, that's an extreme example, but peaks will basically move, they will change intensity, some will disappear altogether. Um, another issue is that these mixtures are not generated every time freshly that you do a screen. They are generated when the library is set up initially, and then they just use the same solution uh, for several years. And over time, uh, things happen, perhaps the compounds react slightly with one another or something, and changes happen. So um, actually doing this kind of matching is, is really awkward and they were kind of doing it all by hand and, and it was all really tedious. So uh, Luca set to work and um, has now got a nice way of matching uh, the controls to the references, um, basically doing it automatically essentially, but then providing importantly um, a uh, quality score. So obviously in this case here, you can see that's a perfect match. You get a, a good score. If you see a good score, then you don't need to look at that manually. And you can just immediately, as a user, hone in on those that have got the low scores, check, okay, what's going on here, make any manual adjustments, um, perhaps exclude a peak from the analysis, and, and then proceed. And importantly, you can then save your um, peak list, and next time you do a screen, you just work from what you had previously. You don't have to do that matching from the start all over again. You just say, oh, actually, what changed compared to what? Um, I still find it slightly odd that that wasn't sort of happening already, but there we go. <laughs> um, we've then also got this uh, really nice user-friendly hit analysis module, which again, we've developed a bit further with the help of um, uh, collaborators at Novartis. Um, so you can look at your data either um, by sample or by substance. And we've got all these um, scores again, which help you really quickly um, hone in on the, the bits of data that are of interest. Um, if you want to change your um, algorithms or your thresholds, the data just updates automatically. And then we've also got these graphs. You can plot anything against anything. Um, you can find regions of interest, um, which you can flag. 
uh, you can um, you can create subsets of data to do further analysis on and that kind of thing. So I do truly believe that this is now the most flexible, most user friendly, and very possibly also the fastest screening software that is out there. Um, and um, well, we're really pleased that lots of companies have been uh, starting to take it up and use it. Obviously, the nice thing is for academic users, any, anyone, any of you are uh, involved in any screening, you get all this for free. So we've got a couple of more things to add on this. One is to enable an easy analysis of intensities by hand, a little bit like what you do in topspin. Um, people like to be able to kind of verify what the program does automatically um, by hand, otherwise they don't trust it. And we also want to have another sort of um, view panel for the hit analysis module, um, so that rather than having lots of tables and having to sort of focus in on the bits that are of interest, you actually just, for each compound, just get one panel with the bit, things that are of interest, and then you can sort of leaf through to the next one in an uncluttered kind of way. Okay, so that's um, where we are. Um, I've kind of covered a sign, screen, and structure. Um, I've not talked about metabolomics because we haven't basically haven't done anything to metabolomics for quite a while, but we're obviously really excited that uh, Morgan is joining the team. And uh, with any luck over the next few years, I'll be talking a bit more about metabolomics as well. Um, no pressure, Morgan. <laughs> so um, really just to, to end with, obviously we realize that um, switching software is um, for many people quite difficult. And uh, you know, it's, it's obviously you have to invest time in order to get used to something new and um, we never, no one ever feels like they've got the time to do that. Um, and to some extent that is fine. There is no real reason for you to have to switch, at least not at the moment. At the moment we're still supporting version two and making sure that when uh, Apple decide to change their um, manufacture of chips, we still, um, processors, we still uh, can run the program. Um, but at some point we will stop. Uh, I hope that um, what I've shown you today perhaps gets, gives you a little bit of a sense of, of where we are and you can get a sense of at what point uh, might be the right time for you to switch. Um, when you do switch, a couple of things for you to consider. Um, remember, I really want you to take <laughs> away with you how easy it is now to write um, your own bespoke macros. I have to say, in version two, I would never have even attempted to write a macro. I just always, you know, it just seemed like the amount of time I'd have to invest was just um, not, not worth the effort. Um, I think in 20 years, probably no more than 10 or 20 people ever wrote macros um, for version two who weren't part of the CCPN team. But in version three, it has become so easy and we've now got um, a macro writing tutorial um, to be on the new website and um, all you need is some really quite basic Python and a little bit of intelligence. And it's fun writing macros. Um, it takes you through step by step. And I mean, I was just really excited earlier in the year. For years, I mean, practically decades, I've been really annoyed by the step when you're doing an assignment and um, you're pick, peak picking your three Ds, uh, the carbon three Ds, and you have to, for every single peak, you've got to say what, whether it's a C alpha or a C beta. And I've always thought this is ridiculous. It's completely predictable in my HNCA which peak this is, <laughs> right? So now I've written a macro that does all that automatically. And all I have to do is press my two key combination and all those carbons are automatically assigned and it's fabulous. And um, you could do that kind of thing too. It's really not that difficult. Um, remember as PhD students that you know, programming skills are transferable. They're, they're good on the jobs market. Um, they make it easy for you to work flexibly and that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, please get in touch. Um, one person was telling me that uh, a group at their um, university had, had tried to switch to version three, but they kind of found it a little bit difficult and struggling with one or two things, and so they've kind of given up. And I just kind of thought, no one from that university ever got in touch with us and asked for any help. And I think if someone thought we were not approachable, I think I'd be quite upset, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, please get in touch if, if you're thinking of um, switching, you know, we can easily, particularly in the UK, you know, it's part of our remit to do workshops with you guys and come and see you and help you. Um, so, so please um, 
come and speak to us if you're struggling with anything. Um, we don't bite, we help. <laughs> so finally, obviously, thank you to lots of people. Thanks as ever to our predecessors um, at CCPM. Thanks to many, many people globally who've been involved with uh, NEF. I think it's really exciting to see that finally coming to fruition. Um, thanks to all our partners and collaborators over the past year, particularly um, the, the team at Novartis and uh, Mike at Amber Analytical Services. And obviously a massive thank you to the CCPM team, um, not just for everyone's work, but for being fabulous colleagues and great fun to work with. Um, it's uh, utterly bizarre that yesterday was the first time we saw each other in person for 18 months. Um, and yeah, but nonetheless, I think we've, we've worked well and supported one, one another well. So thanks and thank you all for coming. I think it's so much nicer to talk to real people than to a computer screen. <laughs>